So next week, we are starting a brand new uh, teaching series in the Gospel of John. Uh, we're going to spend some time in the lead up to Easter, um, looking at John 13 uh, through to 20. Uh, we spent a little bit of time Last Easter, just doing some, you may remember we did some video devotionals, um, Christ's Heart in the Shadow of the Cross, and uh, we just felt there was so much more to dig into there, those verses uh, that we find in those chapters, some of the most intimate and sacred in the whole of Scripture in terms of understanding Christ's heart uh, for um, his disciples then, his disciples now, um, in the shadow of the cross as he was just hours away uh, from going to Calvary. So that's what we're going to be doing uh, in the lead up to Easter. What we're going to be doing in our, in our kind of all-in services, family times together, is we're going to stay in the Gospel of John. And we're going to spend some time um, looking at the miracles of Jesus in the Gospel of John that John specifically um, narrates to us. And, uh, and the reason that we're going to do that is because uh, the Gospel of John is a little bit like a treasure hunt. Okay, so kids, who likes a treasure hunt? Stick hands in the air. Yeah, okay, I love a treasure hunt. Adults, who likes a treasure hunt? Yeah, I really like a treasure hunt. Okay, I like going on a treasure hunt. I also like designing a treasure hunt. Joel and Joe, so my treasure hunt's good. <laughs> overwhelming response I think my treasure hunts are good we did a treasure hunt at uh, Christmas I went around and just you know jotted down some clues and hid some things away uh, for Joel and Josie uh, to kind of follow and solve the clue um, and then get to the kind of final destination because that's what the clues are for right in a treasure hunt they lead you to that final destination and John, who wrote the Gospel of John, writes it a little bit like a treasure hunt, in that in the first half, he lays down some clues or some signs for us to follow. And those clues or signs are generally based around certain miracles that Jesus does. And so those clues, those signs are deliberately put there by John, yeah, to lead us to a specific destination. And we find out what that destination is right at the end of John's gospel. So if you've got your Bibles, you want to turn with me to John chapter 20. Okay, John chapter 20, verse 30 to 31, John writes this, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Okay, so John's point is, I have deliberately selected certain things that Jesus did for a purpose. Right, so Jesus did many other signs which are not written in this book, but these are written, why? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So the clues, the signs yeah, on this treasure hunt that John is putting together are there to lead us to this destination, this revelation that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the promised one who's come to rescue and save his people. He's the Son of God. And that by believing in him, we may have life in his name. So that's the goal. That's the prize, right? When you get to the end of the treasure hunt, yeah, and, and maybe, you know, you get a bit of chocolate or of an Easter one, you get an Easter egg or whatever. The prize of following these clues is life. Life in Jesus' name. Okay, these signs that John records are the moments that reveal to us who Jesus is. They reveal to us something of his glory. Now, in the Old Testament, yeah, when people like Moses did signs, the reason that they did them was to, long word, authenticate God's messenger so that people would believe the message. Right? So people came along and said, God is telling us to do this. Right? Moses, when God reveals himself to, to him and says, go and set my people free. Moses says, well, how are they going to believe me? And he reveals God's name, but he also gives him signs that he can do yeah, to show to the people and to show to Pharaoh like, who he is. That authenticate. They say his message is legitimate, yeah? and he as a messenger is legitimate. Okay, so to understand what that means, imagine, right, that I was a traveling salesman, yeah, trying to sell you this amazing carpet cleaner, 
okay? And I was to say to you, do you know what? This carpet cleaner can clean away absolutely any stain. It doesn't matter what the stain is, whether it's red wine, whether it's baby sick, like doesn't matter what it is, this will clean it away. And I might give you the most amazing presentation. I might be the most dynamic speaker there ever was. Okay, I might have smoke and lights and all kinds of things. And you might be captivated by my message, but you'd still have kind of one thing, right? You'd have one question, which is what, does it actually work? Like show me that it actually works. You'd want a demonstration before you parted with your £2.40, okay, to buy this. And so I would give you a demonstration. I would find a bit of carpet, yeah, which had a stain on, and I would show you, yeah, by my, by my sign, by my demonstration, that what I'm saying is true. Does that make sense? Okay, so the signs of Jesus, yeah, the clues that John lays down were there, okay, Jesus did them to show people yeah, that what he was saying was true and that he was actually God's divine messenger. He was the Christ come to save the world. So the first clue that we're going to look at, the first sign we find in John chapter 2. So if you want to turn with me to John chapter 2, very famous story, okay, about Jesus at a wedding in Cana, okay? So this is our first clue, our first sign. Hello. I can see you. Hello. <laughs> so we're going to read this clue together, okay? So starting with verse 1 of chapter 2. On the third day, see you later. On the third day, there was a wedding. Yeah, you can take that. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the wine, now become, sorry, the water now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed him. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word and we pray now as we spend a few minutes just in reflection of it, Lord, that you would really speak into our hearts, make this story that many of us will be very familiar with come alive in new ways. And may we receive this revelation as we study this sign, as we follow this clue. And may we see you, Jesus, and see something of your glory reflected in it. We pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, so John starts this narrative, right, by setting the scene, yeah? There is a wedding in Cana. Now, weddings are big social events, at least they were before COVID, right? But they're generally big social occasions now, and they were big social occasions, if even more so then, right? So planning for a wedding requires lots of thought, and planning for the guest list often is one of the most difficult things, can be one of the most tense things, you know, for the, for the bride and groom to kind of work through. And I brought with me this morning, okay, this is our actual guest list from our wedding, okay? Look at that. And, um, most of you aren't on this list uh, because we didn't know you then. No offense. So, you know, if we were to get married again, uh, we would invite all of you, okay? Um, but this is the guest list, and this took a lot of kind of thought and discussion and occasional disagreement, okay? And there are, you know, some of the most uh, precious people to us are on this list. I'm not going to lie. There are some randoms that we don't know anymore, and you think, why did we invite them? But hey-ho, I'm not going to tell you who they are. But this was our guest list, okay? And we invited quite a lot of people to our wedding, but nowhere near the number of people that would have been at this wedding in Cana, okay? Because this was like a 
community thing. A wedding at these times, you basically invited the whole village, right? And maybe even people from the next door village. And so we find Jesus' mum Mary's there, and we also find Jesus and his disciples are there as well. And a wedding... Whereas now a wedding takes place in one day, and sometimes they can drag on a little bit, can't they? But weddings in these times would take days, sometimes like a whole week of a wedding, right? Can you imagine it? A whole week of a wedding celebrating. And so Jesus and his mum and his disciples are here at this wedding when disaster strikes, okay? The worst thing that could happen happens, right? And that they run out of wine, yeah? There is no more wine at the wedding, okay? I had to drink all of this last night just to make this point, all right? I'm just kidding. Um, Miriam drank it. (laughs) So there's no wine at this wedding, right? And so today, that would be a bit embarrassing. If that was your wedding, yeah, and suddenly there was no more wine, you'd be a bit like, oh man, I'm really sorry, can we get some in quickly? Someone go down to Tesco, okay? They didn't have Tesco's in those days, right? So no one could just kind of pop out. And so this wasn't just a bit embarrassing for them. Like, this was utterly shameful, Yeah, in a culture where hospitality was so important, to run out of wine at the wedding is like really, really bad news. It's going to bring shame upon the family. Okay, and I wonder if for John, he's making a deeper statement here than just that they ran out of wine. John writes a lot in terms of symbols. Symbols are really important to John. Okay, so he's telling this story, but I think he's making a deeper point about the fact that the wine has run dry because wine in the Old Testament was a picture of spiritual abundance, yeah, or a picture of blessing from God. And so I think John may be making the point that actually, as a people, the people of Israel, their wine yeah, has run dry. Their spiritual abundance, their blessing from God has run dry. And so Mary goes to Jesus and she tells him this problem. And what's really interesting is that Jesus doesn't really seem that bothered. In fact, Jesus is almost a little bit kind of distanced and a bit offish kind of with her. He's like, what's this got to do with me? But what's most striking is that she totally ignores him. He says, what's this got to do with me? And she goes to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you to do. He has basically said, I'm not getting involved. Okay. And she has said, just do whatever he tells you to do. And that, that, that line, do whatever he tells you to do. I mean, we've been thinking over the last few weeks, haven't we, about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And that line kind of encapsulates it all, doesn't it? Do whatever Jesus tells you to do. You want to know the way to abundant life? Do whatever Jesus tells you to do. And so Jesus then decides to get involved. And we've got no idea why. Like, it doesn't describe why. Maybe it was just a bit awkward because the servants kind of just went and stood, like, by him. And he was a bit like, well, I've got to do something now. Like, these guys are looking towards me. But maybe also he saw an opportunity to begin to just a small select people, yeah, but to begin to reveal something of his glory. And so he tells the servants to fill six stone water jars. Now, I don't have... um, Classic historic jars for purification, okay? Um, so the best that I've got is, uh, is this, okay? This kind of plant pop. It looks a bit like a water jug, yeah? So imagine this, right, but a lot bigger, okay? Because the first thing that we find out about these jars is that they're really big. They hold 30 to 20 to 30 gallons of water, right? So he tells the, the, the servants to go and to these six jars and fill them up to the brim, yeah, and John tells us that these jars were used for the Jewish rites of purification, okay? So is there any significance as why Jesus chose these six pots used for ceremonial washing to purify the Jews? And I wonder if Jesus is making a statement to say, now I'm here, these things that you use to wash yourself clean, you're not going to need them anymore, There's a new purpose. There's a new wine coming, okay? And so with the jars full, and I was going to fill up, but do you remember a few years ago when we did the... um the sand, and I thought, no, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay away from water this time, just in case. Okay, but uh, Jesus tells them to get a cup and to fill it up to the brim, and then to dip the cup in and to take the wine to the master of the house. Okay, and you can just imagine how the servants felt, right? So they dip their cup in to what looks like water. They know it's water. They've just filled it up with water, and then with kind of 
trembling hands. They must have thought, what on earth is this? Like, why on earth are we doing this? And carrying it and looking at it and thinking, still looks like water. Still looks like water. Still looks water. And then somewhere along the line, it gets transformed into wine, and they give it to the master of the house. And then what happens? Let's read uh, verse 9 and 10 again. It says, when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine. And I love how understated John is about that. It doesn't make a big deal of it. It just says, the water now become wine. Just matter of fact, Jesus has just done this. No explanation how, not a big deal. He's transformed it into wine, okay? And did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people are drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. And some translations say you have saved the best till last. That comes from Jesus. That comes from Bisto. Okay? You have saved the best till last. You have, you have served the good wine now. And so I want to think just for a second about what this statement means in the context of when it's happening. Yeah, what does this sign mean? What is the clue that John wants us to get? And again, in that context, that religious context, yeah, if the people of Israel, but their wine, the wine of the old covenant, or the the water of the old covenant has run dry, okay, what, what John is trying to make the point, he's trying to say, look, what you had before was good, right? This old covenant, this law, this was good from God, but Jesus has come to do something new. Jesus has come to bring in a new wine of the kingdom. And so by recording this miracle of water into wine, John wants us to see that Jesus is that promised Messiah. He's the one who's coming to usher in this new age. You see, in the Old Testament, wine, as well as being a sign for God's abundance and his blessing, was also a sign of the age of the Messiah. Yeah, the age of the Christ. So if you turn with me very quickly to Isaiah 25, and we're very nearly done. Kids, you're doing amazing. Isaiah 25, verse 6 to 9, says this, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food, full of marrow, of aged wine, well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And so when we think about this wine, this abundant wine flowing at this wedding, it's saying this is this age, this age of the Christ, this age of the Messiah. It's, it's happening. It's starting. And obviously this wedding looks forward to the future marriage supper of the Lamb when we will feast and celebrate with Jesus forever. So this miracle, okay. Oh, sorry, one more thing to say. The, to emphasize this point, okay, there's one more clue that John lays down for us in the story, okay? I wonder if you saw it. Okay, right at the beginning of the story, yeah? This miracle, yeah, when does it happen? We go back to John chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day. What's the point that John's trying to make? What's the clue that he's teasing out for what will later come, the destination? On the third day, this sign of newness, this sign of transformation, this sign of abundant blessing comes about on the third day. It's pointing forwards to Jesus' resurrection when he will begin his new creation. And so what do we do with this story this morning? Well, if you're a Christian here this morning, there is a great encouragement Yeah, that God is the God of transformation. Yeah, that Jesus has come, Lord, to transform the old into something new. That he's done that in our hearts. Yeah, but that he can do that in situations that we face, mindsets that we struggle with as well, circumstances that we can't see a way to change. He's the God who brings transformation. He turns water into wine. And if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, there's an invitation to you to come and receive this new wine. 
Come and drink deeply of this new life on offer. Come and find newness and fullness and abundance of joy that can only be found in Jesus. Shall we pray together? And then we're going to sing a song of worship in response. Yeah, just before we sing, you just want to may, maybe bring something to the Lord or the Holy Spirit. Maybe we want to bring something to your mind that is, uh, that is in need of transformation. Like I said, maybe a situation where you just need God to break through and bring some change. Maybe a mindset or an attitude or something that you're struggling with. Maybe just even your spiritual fervor feels like the wine has run dry. I just believe the Holy Spirit wants to encourage us this morning that he is the one who can bring change and renewal and refreshment and abundance, overflowing abundance. Psalm 23 says, you know, our cup, it overflows. We don't have to have empty cups. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, come and fill afresh our cups with the overflowing joy of the Father this morning. Come and give us faith for situations that need transformation. Thank you that you are still the same God of miracles as you were then. And so we worship you this morning. And as we come to, to sing this final song, we just declare uh, your greatness and your goodness over our hearts and over our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.